all feminism is crap. Yes, all of it. For the years of the wage gap and myth and the pink hats, I said pink, but you know what I mean. Let's start from the beginning. Let's jump all the way to ancient Rome when the economy was thriving, impressive infrastructure was being built, taxes were low, jobs were not hard to find, and an emphasis was put on individual freedom and the family unit. This was 1st century BC. 1st century AD, women, particularly wealthy women, that is important to note, started abandoning their motherhood roles, hiring nannies, shifting from a domestic life to one that they thought they could have more fulfillment. They started demanding property rights and no-fault divorce, and then in turn divorcing their husbands, and Rome felt the breakdown of the family unit across the empire. The Roman Empire enacted a bachelor's tax to help save marriage, but it lost the battle and ended up taxing itself to death. Put a pin in the very early stages of Roman feminism and you will see parallels throughout every wave of feminism. Let's travel to 19th century England where coverture laws defined a marriage and stated that when two are joined in matrimony, they are one. Deriving these ideas from biblical principles, coverture laws assumed much responsibility for the man as the provider and and therefore when the two were married the property owned between them became legally in the husband's name. Coverture laws assumed much responsibility for the man financially and legally as a provider and assumed leader of household representing his family. As stated in Blackloan's Commentary of Law, by marriage a husband and wife are one person under law that is the very being or legal existence of a woman is suspended or at least consolidated or incorporated into that of her husband, under whose wing protection and cover she performs everything. While much case has been given to the perceived oppression of a woman under coverture law, little to no attention has been given to the responsibility of the man or the idea of voluntary trade-offs in a traditional marriage of gender roles. Traditional marriage can come from religious or biological reasons or both. A long-standing tradition of chivalry set up a traditional marriage structure where, in turn for a man's legal and financial responsibility for the family and protection of his family, a woman returns faithfulness, homekeeping, and child-rearing. That is not to say that women were not allowed to work outside of the home or receive higher education prior to feminism. This is a feminist lie. In 1849, Elizabeth Blackwell became the first woman to graduate from medical school and perhaps the most famous nurse of all was Florence Nightingale. Many women worked in the trades. There were Wax and Waves and Phyllis Schlafly went to college in the 1940s and worked as a gunner in, at a night shift to pave her way through college and her mother graduated college in 1920. Madame Curie was not just a great movie that was played by actress Greer Garson. And speaking of actresses, June Cleaver was portrayed by Barbara Billingsley, which in fact was a working woman. The idea that women did not receive higher education or weren't encouraged to work or permitted to work prior to the 1950s is a ridiculous and unfounded argument. However, religious beliefs, social norms, or simply wanting to be a wife and mother were all reasons for women staying at home living traditionally prior to feminism and even today in the mid 19th century england wealthy socialite caroline norton left her husband citing drunkenness and mental and physical abuse however she wasn't known to be a saint herself she was known to use her beauty wit and charm and often scandalous behavior to gain attention and was even rumored to be having an affair. The couple also fought about money. Under the current curvature laws, Caroline Norton couldn't divorce her husband and take half of his money, so instead she tried another way at revenge, spending recklessly and running up the credit in his name. The couple battled custody during separation, but under current curvature laws, the husband being the main provider and head of house was granted full custody but not if left up to Caroline Norton. 
Her constant petitioning to the courts and Queen Victoria herself led to the Custody of Infants Act of 1839, Matrimonial Causes of 1857, and paved the way for Women's Property Rights Acts of 1870, which reformed coverture laws by default giving so sole custody of the children by the mother in case of divorce. Legal status of property of women as to not lose any of their husband's earnings, and expanding divorce to the civil courts as to make divorce more accessible to a wide range of people. What didn't change about coverture laws? The husband's financial responsibility under a law to provide for his household and under divorce, two households. Quite the vindictive one, Caroline Norton. A division of the sexes by entitled wealthy women have already been noted twice here. Interestingly enough, Frederick Ingalls and Karl Marx were already doing their own work on feminism about the same time. It was the Marxist idea that women were oppressed under a capitalist society for not being monetarily compensated for the domestic work. Marx is a contribution to political critique of economy in 1859. This gender warfare mimics the class warfare of the proletet and the bourgeoisie, also pressed by Marx. The idea is that when there is class struggle, especially when there's a clearly defined oppressor and oppressed, government can swoop in and gain control. This is not a new idea, as in 16th century Machiavelli states in the Discourses, in every republic there are two dispositions, that of the populace and that of the upper class, and legislation favorable to liberty is brought out by the clash between them. In 1848, Frederick Ingalls published The Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State. In this text, Ingalls argues that unless a woman is giving private ownership of her own property, that she is in fact a slave by her husband. He traces fixation of virginity before marriage and purity and submissiveness during marriage to the patriarchal nuclear family and lacks of property rights for women. Remember Caroline Norton? But surely suffrage, hashtag votes for women, was a just movement, right? Actually, there was a difference between the suffragette movement and the suffragist movement. The suffragists were a group of men and women, working class and middle class, looking for universal suffrage, starting in the early 19th century. But by the mid-19th century, a group of upper class women only group, the suffragettes, wanted to demand the rights only for women and only for those who they favored, demanding the vote on the same terms as franchisement for men, who didn't even have the vote as a collective at this point. These women were looking for superiority and entitlement, just as modern-day feminists, and with as much anti-male rhetoric. The Declaration of Sentiments, published in 1848, primarily authored by prominent feminist Elizabeth Cady Stanton, mirrored the Declaration of Independence, even stating the male gender as the oppressor just like America had the tyranny of Great Britain. Even stating, but when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing inevitably the same object, if this is a design to reduce them under such object, it is their duty to throw off such government and provide new guards for their new security. To throw off such government. And that did try. The domestic terrorism of the suffragettes may have started with Mary Dunlop in 1909 with graffiti and hunger strikes to be released from prison after such crimes. Men were not released from prison on the same grounds. But by 1912, the suffragettes were using chemical attacks in mailboxes, bombings, breaking windows, and even an attempted murder of the British Prime Minister. But let's not let those who got to choose to write history, rewrite history. There was an anti-suffrage movement among the working class of women who thought the abolition of traditional gender roles would be the breakdown of the family and were more sympathetic to the working conditions and the wars their men had to fight than their upper middle class feminist opposites. Feminism has always been a first world problem. Ancient Rome, Caroline Norton, the married property acts and marriage reform, and now suffrage. In America, many states had already given women the vote by the late 19th century, but as war efforts grew for World War I, 
Feminism took a shift from focusing on suffrage to the White Feather Movement. The White Feather Movement was a group of women who handed out pamphlets urging men to go fight wars for them, proving that the feminists only cared to have one gender hold up their, ter their traditional gender role in society. President Wilson saw the opportunity with World War I on the rise to give women the vote. And in June 1919, after much debate and filibustering and then finally casting a vote, the 19th Amendment was passed and then ratified in the states in 1920. World War I, the Great Depression, and World War II saw a decline in feminist movements. People were a little busy protecting their families, and like I said, feminism is a world, first world problem. The post-war economic boom of the 50s saw cool new things like television and automatic dishwashers and washing machines that were able to be mass-produced and housewives had new modern kitchens. Of course, if you talk to Gloria Steinem, she would say that it was all a patriarchal conspiracy to keep women at home after being involved in war efforts. They give a lot of credit to people who they presumably hate so much. The family unit, traditionalism, and the economy thrived throughout the 50s and early 60s, but of course feminists aren't happy with being happy. And just like every other time in history, they have to get moving when things are a little bit good. They get a little bored and entitled. The second wave feminism had begun. In 1964, Betty Friedan published The Feminine Mystique, which claimed to answer the question, are housewives happy? Of course, with biased research and unfounded shady psychology, Friedan answered no. And that wasn't all. She concluded that housewives were looking for sexual fulfillment in overbearing and destructive ways. Yes, we can think Betty Friedan for the lovely stereotype of the repressed and oppressed sex-starved housewife in The Rescuing Milkman. To quote Betty Friedan, a woman has never had an orgasm shining a kitchen floor. I won't go there. In this wave of feminism, we really see the Marxist ideas take hold of the cultural narrative of our country and even an economic standpoint as communist policy starts slipping into our country. The idea was that women were oppressed and men were their oppressors. One Sheila Cronin, a feminist of uh, the National Organ Organization for Women, even quoted, Marriage constitutes slavery for women, and it is important that the women's movement focuses on attacking this institution. Freedom for women cannot be won without the abolition of marriage. We see a culture shift in the mid to late 1960s as sexual liberation for women without consequences becomes a feminist agenda, with birth control and Planned Parenthood taking wave in the 60s and abortion being talked about and then legalized in the 1970s. Feminists honed in on this idea that a woman is not truly liberated if not sexually liberated from her husband. Many forget or are simply not aware of Margaret Sanger's reasons for birth control and abortion beliefs. It wasn't just that she wrapped up a woman's identity and her ability to determine when she bore her own children, but she believed in eugenics. A push for more women to work outside the home was well on its way with the likes of Gloria Steinem and Betty Friedan devaluing the traditional homemaker and the male breadwinner, essentially devaluing the traditional family. What happens when the family unit is destroyed? We learn this from Marx and Engels. Government takes over. Next on the agenda was wage control and a gender-free society pushed by the idea of the ERA, Equal Rights Amendment. As benevolent and enticing as Equal Rights Amendment sounds, we can already see that feminists don't really care for equal rights, but superiority. Also, the ERA was redundant in many ways. The Equal Pay Act of 1963 had already been passed, but feminists 
Again, superiority didn't care about equal pay for equal work. They cared about equal pay for comparable worth, as ERA opponent Phyllis Schlafly had stated. I've seen through many debates and talks on the ERA back in the 70s and early 80s after its defeat that feminists wanted the nurse to be paid the same amount as a doctor just because there were more women nurses and more men male doctors. Seniority, work experience, resume, fields, education, and rank mean nothing to feminists. They wanted superiority of men in all areas of life and were happy to use the government to do it. Thankfully, the ERA was defeated by the hard work and dedication of Phyllis Schlafly in her Eagle form. Women's Lib continued through the 70s, burning bras, and had a slight decline in the 80s when, again, the economy was doing a little bit better, and an increase in the 90s with Hillary Clinton and her ridiculous pants suits and obsession with crushing that gra glass ceiling. I've said before that the difference between a feminist and anti-feminist is that feminists are obsessed with seeing a glass ceiling, yet anti-feminists never saw that ceiling in the first place because her worth isn't tied into bringing others down. So now we come to our current wave of feminism. We are, as a society, obsessed with rape culture, the idea of rape culture and men being inherently rapists. Meanwhile, if a woman takes measures to protect herself, she is accused of internalized misogyny, the same internalized misogyny if you happen to believe in traditional gender roles and that your husband is the head of the household. Slut walks and hypersexuality see a moral decay of our culture, but even confuse second wave feminists as Camille Paglia, who states that third wave feminists are asking for government control and intervention, the one that they wanted to be free from in the 60s. I have always seen feminists as always asking for government control and intervention. Definitely we see a moral decay when we put more an emphasis on liberation rather than personal responsibility and self-protection. The idea that men are raping one after another and without consequence, what's really going on here? Who rape and are convicted guilty by a jury go to prison. There's no conspiring system that keeps rapists out of prison in the West. We do not have that culture in the West. They do in other countries in other parts of the world. Men who even make rape jokes have known to lost their jobs and men who do not commit rape, well they go to prison as well. Take the case of Brian Banks who spent five years in prison for a false rape accusation and another five years wrapped up in courts. Ten years of his life lost because of a false rape case. And if feminists really cared about victims of rape they wouldn't be perpetually lying about rape cases that never happened and devaluing the the importance and the severity of actual rape cases and actual victims but of course there's that shaky definition of what is really rape uh, it changes from day to day from actual sexual violence to catcalling also when taking into account prison rape men are raped more than women on average. Another current feminist narrative is the myth of the wage gap. Just like second wave feminists, they don't take into account different fields, job titles, seniority, or, or education. And the wage gap has absolutely no basis. Click in the description where I will link my sources to see Karen Strawn epically debunk the wage gap better than I ever could with math. Of course, if there is actual discrimination in the workplace and sexism towards men or women in the workplace, well, that's been illegal since 1963 and we have a judicial system for a reason. But no amount of wage control or thought policing is going to make any feminist more happy. There's always going to be something more to complain about. For instance, toxic masculinity. Now, just like the white feather movement in earlier in the speech, feminists only care about gender roles when it is convenient for them. 
when boys are being boys in the classroom, 20% of them will be diagnosed with ADHD and put on drugs like Ritalin. And words like mansplaining and man spreading are common words used by well to do and nothing better to do with themselves feminists. Masculinity seems to be only convenient for feminists when in times of war or natural disasters, when day in and day out men are degraded by society for offering to cover a dinner tab or open a door for a woman. If chivalry is dead, feminism killed it. Family courts are stacked up against men and affirmative action in pro-female quotas pushed by the government is systematically proving our society to be not a patriarchy, but a matriarchy. At no point in time has feminism ever been for the average woman. It has always been a movement for entitled, vindictive, anti-male, well-to-do women with nothing better to do than to spread anti-male rhetoric, divide the sexes, and allow government to take control of their private lives, private businesses, and push their agenda for superiority. Communities and charities are giving away to big government as communist policies seep into not only national policy, but local policy and private business. If there is a case to be made for cultural Marxism, it is now. It has seeped into our education system and infected the minds of the youth since the 60s. And that generation is running the government right now. An alarming number of people don't believe in love, family, or marriage, especially a growing number of men who are opting out of relationships. But who can blame them? When society has turned against the male, the homemaker, the family, the community, and it is all one big fat lie to use women as a government pawn, and that is actually more patronizing than anything that the feminists think that the patriarchy has done to them. So how do we turn it around? Well, I hate to use the words of liberals, but resist and persist. <laughs> Educate yourself on the red pill movement, learn the laws in your state, and write, campaign, and advocate for a systematic change. Voice your opinions. I'm a traditionalist, but don't get me wrong, Feminism has given me absolutely nothing. And that includes the current divorce laws. A feminist commentary on one of my videos stated that when my husband cheats on me, all I will have left for me is alimony because I'm uneducated and jobless. That's the difference between a feminist and a traditionalist. I do not see men as inherently bad or inherently cheaters or inherently rapists. I see the benefit of complementary roles and the strong family unit doing what it can to roll back these bad policies. So in the words of my dad, sell it down the road, sister.